Okay. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Cashless Consumers Payment Deep Dives, where we discuss Indian payments and fintech. Today we have with us uh, Tarunima Prabhakar, research fellow at Center for Long Term Cyber Security at UC Berkeley. She'll be presenting her study titled "A New Era for Credit Scoring." Uh, followed by the paper presentation, we'll be joined by discussions. Many Chug of Dwara Research and Pani Kodalori of Base Account. Uh, we'll then have audience Q&A. People joining in uh, through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, please post your comments and questions. Uh, we'll have them answered at the end. Uh, over to you, Tarnima. Yeah, great. Um, just checking that I'm still audible. And yeah. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Great. So, uh, hi everyone, um, and thank you to the Cash Consumer Forum for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, I've uh, spoken to a few people from the fintech, fintech industry in India, but I really look forward to this opportunity to actually discuss some of the more processed thoughts. So, this paper uh, started out uh, when uh, so I was a researcher, research fellow at the Center for Long Term Cybersecurity between June 2018 and August 2019, which is when I pursued this research. And uh, the entry point for me towards this research was um, how are prediction algorithms changing access to essential services in India. So I didn't come at it uh, looking specifically uh, at financial inclusion, but really approaching it from the perspective of um, the algorithms, which might be reflected in the way I uh, present today as well. So, um, you know, why, if that was my perspective, why did I start looking at lending? So one, because, uh, the formulation of lending as a prediction problem predates the rise of machine learning. And uh, there's a clear business case for adoption of these algorithms um, it's in cre credit dispersal. So one, because you know um, we've had digital payments and we've had digital pay payment platforms that have been on the rise since 2016. Um, but increasingly, we're also seeing uh, sort of platforms that we wouldn't have expected to turn into credit platforms. Also uh, resort to that as a way of monetizing their platform. Um, in some ways, credit markets and banks have been heavily regulated in India, as well as in several other countries. So it gave me an existing regulatory framework to draw from and to understand how some of the you know, newer um, sort of models and algorithms, how to what extent do, do they honor the, the spirit and the letter of this regulation. Um, and also that a lot of these ideas on regulating machine learning were emerging from, from lending regulation in the United States. Most notably, this whole idea of disparate impact came from credit regulation um, of the 70s uh, in the US. Um, I'm going to pause uh, about every, I guess, like five slides to, uh, to see if anyone has questions. I'm going to skip over some of these terminologies. So, uh, so generally speaking, you know, fat like this whole area of like fairness, accountability, transparency of uh, algorithms of machine learning, uh, it just loves this idea of credit decisions as a example to explain predominantly discrimination, uh, because that's one of the reasons why in the U.S. if you have such heavy regulation around the the sorts of data and the sorts of algorithms that are used for credit decisions. It's, it's motivated from, and I'll get into this in the future, is it's motivated from the uh, anti-discrimination legislation. Um, and in some ways, again, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it's an easy, credit is an easy problem to formulate as a prediction problem. So it's also in some ways an easy uh, way to explain some of the challenges uh, with, the, with the algorithms. Okay. Um, so while I was looking at lending, I'm less interested in the fly-by-night operations, you know, that are exploiting enforcement loopholes and the regulatory vagueness. But I was really interested in understanding how existing regulation is affecting long term and strategic business choices. And consequently, what are the implications for consumer welfare? Okay, so I'm just going to stop here very quickly. It's only about four minutes in. Is there anything I can, should I clarify maybe disparate impact or disparate treatment are these terms that are relatively clear? Arindama, you need to share your screen, I guess. Oh, is it? Oh, oh, I wish. Sorry, I didn't realize the screen wasn't visible. Um, give me a second. So the, you, guys, you guys missed a cute <laughs> joke I had somewhere on the slides. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, is it visible now? Yes. Okay, great. Great, great, great. So yeah, I was just saying that um, this is what I had to say that, you know, in general, the, uh, the image on the right is something that Google has been using. It's, a, it's an example that Google has had used to explain how they are sort of dealing with, the, with discrimination in their data sets. Uh, and then I had just said that I'm yeah, not really interested in fly-by-night operators. So I wanted to just pause and see if there were any questions about, say, disparate impact or like the fat ML space. Um, okay, I'll move on. So uh, to, to get into this space, what I did was I did some desk research on the regulatory landscape, both in, the, in India and in the US. Um, and to understand, you know, how that regulatory landscape was matching with or not matching with the consumer concerns. Um, I wanted to understand what the consumer concerns with some of this entire alternative lending sector was. And so for that, uh, I looked at Play Store reviews. And um, I, I, I should give a shout out to Praneet because I think it was in that conversation that I realized that in some ways, Play Store reviews are uh, the primary source we have right now. It's the primary disbursement mechanism, uh, sort of uh, redressal mechanism. And so that's why I was looking at Play Store reviews. And then there were, of course, uh, interviews with different people in the think tank space, data scientists, business executives. And that was also informing the broader framework of the study. So uh, this is a sort of dense timeline, but also a very trimmed timeline of uh, credit regulation in the US. So um, since the country's inception, the US has had a strong hand in regulating credit markets. There's some interesting history about how, uh, to a large extent, credit markets became uh, regulated and came under federal administration because um, in the Civil War, there was a need for credit so, um, and to, to win the war. And therefore, the, there was a lot of uh, emphasis at that time to bring those institutions under government uh, administration. I, it's, it's a history that I'm not very familiar with, but I just think it's an interesting uh, side note. Uh, but by the early, tw early 20th uh, century, which is like um, the early 1900s, you already had um, sort of this call for standardization of consumer loan outfits. So you had these early credit unions um, that had started coming about to serve different banks because they realized that you, know, you needed a consolidated place uh, for records of all these, um, for all, a lot of different borrowers. But at that time, the credit unions would capture information on arrests. They would capture information of promotions, marriages and deaths. And so now let's jump about 40 years and then you come to 1960s, which is where uh, the civil rights movement is happening. Uh, the report on the U.S. Commission of, uh, report on housing by the U.S. Commission of Civil right, Rights notes that there's systematic discrimination in mortgage to black population. And so in the, in the 60s and early 70s, you actually see a lot of movement, but also a lot of regulation against discrimination. So we see that there's a legislation to prohibit discrimination in home lending. There is uh, this Truth in Lending Act, which is enforces that people must disclose the cost and the charges of credit so that people can compare the different, um, you know, sort of loan outfits and where they want to take a loan from. Um, then in 1976, you have this Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which for the first time says that it is not sufficient to say that I did not intend to discriminate. Even inadvertent discrimination became illegal. And one of the reasons for this was that um, they had observed that, you know, zip codes were being used as proxies for race. So even though lenders were not denying loans based on, or not explicitly denying loans based on race, they were deny, denying loans based off zip code. And since zip code and race were so closely related, um, they were indirectly discriminating based on race. So uh, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act tried to make such uh, efforts at sort of uh, covered and underhand discrimination. Um, so to try and make that illegal. Um, so then you, again, I'm jumping about like 20, like 14, 15 years, and then you get to 1980s. And this is again, because there's a lot of uh, regulation on the banks. And so banks spin off companies as monoline credit cards, and these credit card companies get fairly creative. So this is when you have MBNA, you have Capital One, and these come about, and they are fairly 
creative in that even though US legislation prevents you from uh, collecting sort of data or non-financial data on consumers, they started doing interesting things like looking at spending patterns, which is still financial data, but doing a lot of in capital one is famous for using analytics for, um, you know, discovering new, new markets. And so they start uh, preempt sort of sending offers and customizing cards and sending like these pre-approved cards. And so you have, you actually see a spike in the number of credit card owners around the eighties. And so by 2018, over 80% of the population has access to formal credit. Uh, in some form. So that could be mortgage, that could be credit cards, that could be car loans, right? Um, which means that there's a record for about 84% is what I remember from 2018 uh, with a credit bureau in the US. Okay. So uh, what, what the credit regulation as a consequence uh, did was that one that it prohibited collection of non-financial data it prohibited discrimination explicit on in inadvertent. It requested that uh, every time a third party requests for credit reports, that request must be disclosed to individuals. So let's say an employer or a landlord, you know, at some point is making a request for a credit report that must be disclosed to an individual. And it also resulted in like these, uh, like this downstream impact. So there was this, there is this uh, stipulation for right to explanation. So a bank or a lender must provide a right to explanation when a loan is denied. But it led to like this downstream impact so that even credit bureaus uh, in the US now have to, you know, come up with this rubric. So they come up with <coughs> this rubric of all the reasons why your credit score might be low. Because ultimately banks need to use this information and banks need to provide reasons, um, you know, that are then drawn from this report. So this is something, this is a screenshot of uh, the reason codes provided by FICO. My understanding is that these reason codes are relatively recent. So even though this right to explanation was stipulated in the seventies, this, this practice of FICO um, and TransUnion and uh, Experian putting out these uh, reason codes is more recent and post recession. <coughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to be somewhat quick with this section because I believe everyone in the audience is very familiar with this, this area. So uh, when it comes to digital lending in India by 2018, less than 3% of Indians had access to a credit card. The total number of consumer loans were only 80.2 million, but you know, we had half a billion Indians using the internet. So the government policy has been tolerant and often encouraging of digital lending models. Um, and again, I think everyone probably already knows this, that there is no specific regulation for this sector. And so uh, I had to sort of look at all the regulation that could apply to the sector and try and understand uh, what was the overall regulation for, um, you know, just different entities that provide credit. So we have something called the Credit Information Companies Regulation Act, which is specifically for a trans union um, or, Excuse me. So yeah, it's, it's specifically for like a few regulators. And so, but this law regulates credit information companies, right? So it doesn't really regulate banks, but it, enfo it enforces that, you know, if a bank ever uses a credit information report, they must provide specific reason um, that they have rejected a loan. If that loan is, has been made, if that decision has been made on the basis of the, uh, of a credit information report. But of course, like when I started thinking about it a little more, I mean, a lot of banks probably don't make their decisions based on uh, information from credit information companies, in which case, you know, the interesting thing is what happens, you know, how does this law ever come into force? Because yeah, you, in, in the Indian context, you can make decisions based on a lot of other criteria as well. Um, the personal data protection bill is interesting because, you know, it, uh, amongst all the other reasonable purposes for non-consensual processing of data, uh, credit scoring definitely stands out as an outlier because a lot of the other uh, reasonable purposes are around national security. But at, at the moment, uh, the way the bill stands, credit scoring and in effect alternative lending is allowed to collect a lot of your um, personal data, which is location, contacts, network, all of that um, to make a decision on, your, on whether or not to provide you a loan. 
Um, the other interesting so guidelines are the RBI, RBI guidelines on fair practices code. And so it, it lays down principles and these principles are of course laid for banks and NBFCs. But since alternative lending platforms have to in the back end be tied with one of the two, um, in effect, it was useful for me to look at these guidelines and see that how would they extend, um, you know, how would they extend to alternative lenders as well. Uh, I, I hadn't a, a sort of, uh, it wasn't till recently when, you know, the RBI came up with the fresh guidelines. I always assumed that the NBFC and bank guidelines would ap apply to alternative lenders. But as became clear uh, over the last two months, that actually wasn't the case. So uh, RBI actually had to come out and clarify and say that, uh, those, those rules will apply to these lending apps as well. Uh, Tarinda, can you just go on a full screen mode? Uh, people on YouTube are not able to see the slides. Mm. Okay, I am on. Okay, give me a second. This, do you, so this play button doesn't work. Evidently, right? Okay. So this is not. Um, let's see. Um, is this better if I just do this? Yeah, it's just yeah. Setting it better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just stick to this then. Okay. Uh, so I'm also going to pause if there are any questions. Also, Shrikant, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, yeah, you know, if, for, for things like these, for like the tech fixes in the middle of the presentation, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we. So when I had on the sec for the second stage of the study, which is when I was trying to understand what is the consumer per perception of digital lending, right? What are some of the concerns that consumers have for this? Um, I landed up relying on Play Store reviews. So as per a 2019 survey, there are about 338 retail and small business uh, lenders. Uh, a lot of them, you know, are, for example, there's a whole variety. So there's the ones who provide unsecured lending, there are people who provide um, so, uh, secured lending, some people that spe focus specifically on MSMEs. And so uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, very strategic reasons, it actually made sense for me to look at unsecured lend of uh, look at consumer lending and then also unsecured lending because in some ways that's where the the um, consumer concerns are most highlighted that's kind of where there's most most room for uh, using data in as a as a sort of <laughs> like collateral in some ways right because if you have secured lending there's far lesser need for you to rely on um, your like a person's phone data to make a decision about them or to like consist consistently monitor them on a day-to-day -day basis about whether they're going to repay something or not. So I narrowed, I narrowed down to 11 fintechs that focused on consumer lending that were looking at unsecured lending and they had an Android app, which implies that the borrower had proactively opted for the lender. Now, a lot in a lot of cases, these uh, app, these lending fintechs don't necessarily operate via an app, right? So they might have partnerships with e-commerce platforms, they might already be sort of uh, mapping your social media usage, but participation in those kinds of um, so platforms or in those kind of arrangements is not explicit. And so it, um, it just makes it harder to research that area as well. And then finally, because we, I was seeing so many apps sort of spring about and then pivot in three months or completely die down. Uh, I wanted to focus on apps that actually reflect long-term trends of the industry, which is why I look, you know, these 11 apps were selected because they had been downloaded at least 500 times. So generally what, what came about uh, or what I understood from these 11 apps was that they were targeting intra-marginal consumers, right? So these are consumers that have some cash inflow and this is either through salaries or from families, but they either have, a, they have a very, sort of poor a thin credit file or a credit file which has them listed for a lot of defaults. Um, and they're also targeted towards consumption smooth, smoothing and responding to emergencies. So this is not necessarily like providing credit to someone who's never accessed credit in their life or has, you know, no access to formal financial services. But the idea is that 
uh, you might not be eligible you know your for example parents might not have had a credit history but your you are now in a corporate job and so we we think that you you are like reliable and we can provide you some uh, money to sort of smooth like enable you to consume more so whether it's in terms of film tickets or you know zomato so things like those um, and then of course responding to emergencies a lot of the comments you know what i learned was that people were just trying to get money if they had to get go to a hospital or something of that sort um and then the two most common de- targeted demographics were students and salaried individuals and the in terms of geographic reach it was a lot of tier 1 and tier 2 cities the the most extensive app covered 50 cities okay um i've already spoken about this so just the time frame of analysis was 1st of jan 2017 till 31st of april 2019 and um, of course i had to like spend some time cleaning up the data i think one thing that consistently comes up when i speak of um app play store reviews is that our play store reviews even reliable right because there are strong incentives by app providers to create fraudulent re- reviews um in particular there was one app provider for which i the amount of time it took me to scrape two worth two years worth of data for most apps i could only scrape like six months worth of data and it was very very clear that that you know there was some massive uh, network just creating fake reviews for that app um so the strong incentive because one that they're trying to boost their own app but they're also trying to damage the competitor's reputation in the market and um, unfortunately even you know most researchers that work specifically on text analysis have converged that spam detection and removal on play store reviews is limited um but it's still for me it was also still worth it and i think it's it's uh, something i have to keep telling myself because it was a little tedious is that one that not all comments are fake and that second that there are only uh, this is the only place for at least some form of redress right so like there isn't a better uh, mechanism or at this point there is unfortunately not a better place where you can go to understand some of these concerns um i think the other best alternative would be to actually go and do a field survey of sorts so um generally if you like when i had analyzed this content you know one thing that is very clear and this is something that is expected is that the length of review is um sort of inversely proportional to the the rating so like if you are very if you're very unhappy you actually write longer reviews and if you're just you know if you're happy and then google or the the app providers consistently nudging you to say that can you please rate our app can you please rate our app you're probably just going to go and say good right um also that um and so that's just one distribution but it, it also is if you're writing template reviews it, you're most likely going to write you know fairly short re- uh, like reviews such as i love this app right and so um for for the analysis i basically cleaned up removed any reviews that had fewer than five words so that listed i mean a lot of the positive reviews got filtered out which is fine because i wasn't trying to do anything of sentiment analysis i was really trying to understand like substantive 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 concerns um also just did uh, like removing duplicate reviews in case people were you know reposting reviews or people just copy pasting reviews so i started with about 1.5 lakh reviews and then landed up with about 80000 reviews after cleaning it and so <laughs> this is just me me maybe saying this to myself which is to say that the reviews are worth something um which is so if you see this is a like an inverse tf idea which is to say that you know you're waiting you're seeing terms that are unique to the specific apps and that have not been repeated across all the 11 apps right and it tells you something about these platforms so simple for example you very clearly say that you can see that it's about merchants it's about you see book my show listed a lot um you see all yeah so you can kind of see that it's it's something about merchants and then you also see the competitor name lazy pay which is interesting um and similarly with crazy bee you can tell that it's more about colleges and campus um and directed towards students um the other interesting thing that i i remember i think this was for cashy where you know philippines as a as a term popped out and i think it's because Phil, i mean there were a couple of comments i had to go back and look at why philippines was popping out and maybe one of you can tell me but it seemed like a couple of people from philippines had been downloading the app and you know there were questions about why am i not getting an otp are you guys even active in philippines so maybe at some point cashy was trying to enter philippines is my sense um okay so um after this sort of you know this uh, 
summarizing of this data i eventually just started extracting you know looking at comments specific comments based off keywords and so these keywords included things like thief credit loan and seeing how you know what what were the responses that i was getting or what were the comments specific to these keywords for each of these 11 apps so one thing that was very clear was that users expect ease um in in like accessing and navigating these platforms right so they expect ease in in the way they expect ease from any mobile app but they also expect ease in accessing credit and this is also in part because apps themselves also market them uh, market themselves as instant loan plat platforms so this ease of applying and quick turnaround is heavily advertised um i think it's not the the colorfulness is not consistent and the sort of exuberance of like we will give you a loan is not uh, consistent across all platforms but a lot of them do uh, and so users come to digital lending apps when often other alternatives are failed and so they they kind of just often come thinking that they will get approved so i'm um, uh, i have these call out buttons partly because they're also fun so uh, here are <laughs> these comments where someone is saying that oh you know it was so easy to apply for a loan loan here compared to other banks and then someone says that oh i'm a banker so i you know i'm really surprised to see how quickly some of these things were done um okay and so so that's the positive side the the ease and timeliness of access is the positive side and now i'm sort of talking about the the risks of some of these platforms right so one of the big things that stands out with these apps is debt recovery so there were three broad broadly three categories through or three mechanisms through which these apps were trying to recover their loans one was that they were using social the individual social networks and by social networks i mean you know your phone contacts in some cases one person had alleged that uh, the the lender had somehow reached through their facebook network i don't know how accurate that is but had somehow uh, found details of some person on his facebook um then you have the second mechanism which is you, you you're using mobile phone as collateral and the third mechanism is that you're uh, you threat threaten the individual that they're going to reduce their civil score so in the first case where you have social networks this uh, came in news one and a half months yeah one and a half months back where you know z news did this whole coverage where they, they basically said that um you know if if you default on your loan they call your parents or they call your boss so and this is something that is fairly clear when you sign up for the app in the terms and conditions for a lot of these apps it clearly says that uh, we might might reach out to your contacts um in case of a default um but obviously I, I, one of the concerns is that people don't read those terms but also in one particular comment there was something about how the person said that i was told that they would reach out after a month why did they reach out in the day after i you know i did not pay so you should have at least given me a month so there were concerns of those sorts using mobile phone as collateral is interesting because a lot of apps do collect your imei number one an, one app in particular um tried to use that imei number to say that uh, you know somewhere in the terms and conditions they had written that if you default on this this loan and however tiny it is that phone is signed off to us as collateral and so they would report the in they they would report the individual's phone as uh, lost and so there is um a comment somewhere here which is um i i yeah so it's it's written here right they say that you should give nominal instruction like we're not able to pay them and they did a phone block via my stolen imei number and so there's another comment where someone says i'm going to report you to the police so that's fairly interesting i think this was there were only about two or three comments about this mechanism so i'm assuming this lender tried it out and then stopped fairly soon after the most common one is uh, you know threatening people to reduce their credit score okay the the second concern is privacy and i'm going to club that with surveillance uh, i think they're they're very closely related now all apps collect their network information and um and storage information i think this is fairly expected because you need to store documents and you need to um sort of access documents from a person's phone all apps requested for location information which is also interesting which just goes to say that people just assume that location information is very kosher when you make lending decisions uh 10 of them collected contacts seven collected sms four collected 
permissions to record audio. Um, ostensibly, because some of them were doing video verification, and so for that reason. But yeah, it's it's not entirely entirely clear uh, why. Okay, so these are two. These are the screenshots of these two apps that um you know splash screens when you sign up for them i think one i put this here just to highlight that a lot of them actually make it fairly clear how they're using your data and um so it's it's um one is early salary and the other is crazy b and in both cases they're actually saying that we're going to use your contact information to estimate your credit score in i think in the crazy b example they're also saying that you know, we're going to collect your IMEA number, we're going to collect your serial number. It, it goes fairly uh, in depth about all the things it's going to collect. So they're not, they're not trying to actively hide how they're using this, this information. But having said that, you know, notice and consent is known to be fairly flawed uh, when it comes to digital services. So one thing that was very interesting and perhaps also obvious once you read it is that the data sharing is perceived as threat once the loan is rejected, right? So people might provide their content. Uh, they might even like say, yes, 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 because they're excited to give, uh, to get a loan. And so this comment on the right is showing that the person obviously got a loan twice, but it was when they, when that loan was rejected that the person sort of became very annoyed. And so then they left a comment saying, but you know, they will also steal your data um, if you install this app. So the data sharing sort of gets perceived as unfair or as a theft once the loan is rejected. Again, some sort of like entitlement as well to, to the, uh, the loan from these, these platforms. So one thing we know is that notice and consent framework is limited, but specifically for lend lending apps, it is incomplete. And so the reason I say this is because a loan is inherently a probabilistic service. Right. So if we were to ever sort of participate in a lottery, right. And someone did not tell you what your probability of winning was, um, how would I ever judge whether I should actually pay the money to participate in that lottery or not? And so by that same logic, if we, we I think on the more, for the most part, we don't all agree that, um, your personal data is, has a non-trivial cost, right. It's a non-zero cost. And so I'm happy to trade it but I should know what is my expected gain and you can't really calculate your expected gain or even sort of estimate your estimate uh, expected gain without really knowing what the probability of being approved is. And so I think this is something both that is relevant for regulation, but also perhaps helpful for lenders to in some ways um, mitigate this perception of uh, that people have that, you know, they were cheated or the data was stolen. Because if they know that there's a very low rate of approval to begin with, they perhaps will be more mindful when they're sharing some of their, uh, some of their data. Okay, so I am going to pause here. Uh, Srikant, if there have been any questions, I'm not really looking at the chat window. No questions yet. Okay, great. So, um, I'm, I'm running out of time. Okay. So uh, the final thing, no, it's not even, not even close to final. Uh, the third concern with consumer protection is explainability of the decision. One of the things is that users actually care why their limit is lower than expected, right? So uh, someone will say, but my friend got so much money. Why did I not get this money? And so um, one thing that's very clear is that lending apps don't have to provide a reason for rejection. And it's not just because they're not bound by NBFC rules, but it's also because NBFCs are not bound to provide a reason for rejection, which banks are. And with CICRA, uh, the Credit Information Company Regulation Act also stipulates is a right to explanation. I think it's still, it's, uh, for me, it's uh, an open research question is to say, what does this right of explanation, even in how it is written and mandated for banks, what does that mean um, on ground? Because you know, some certain apps will give an auto response to some of these complaints and say that, you know, you do not fulfill our internal criteria, but what does that internal, I mean, is that sufficient explanation or is that not? So, um, I mean, this is, this for me is a fairly interesting open research idea. Um, so just, just to understand what this way, the weight of, or the lack of explainability is somewhat important for alternative lending in India, right? So this is something that a data scientist had mentioned, which is that, in US, you now have enough, you have a strong record of financial data for most citizens, which means that you can, you can continue to use financial data and make lending decisions based on that. 
but in the indian context if you were to enforce this clause of ex explanation you would restrict one the kinds of data that could be used and second you would re restrict the forms in which that data would be um, sort of amalgamated and computed right so either because explanations can be um unintuitive so i might say that i might come and say that you know you, it is because your location data you travel to xyz place and uh, that's why i've denied your denied your loan but that's not really an intuitive explanation and the second issue is that the the even the engineers might not really be able to tell you what the algorithm like why the algorithm is like spun out the number it's spun out right so in both these cases you if you were to enforce explainability you actually might be uh, foregoing certain accuracy and so if uh, you're a small lender and this is the claim of the data scientist is that if you're a small lender your profit margins are very small and so every inch of accuracy is actually fairly important to you which is why uh, from his uh, from their perspective it was important that this explanation not be mandated uh, for ndfcs okay so um, finally this is now in the discussion section there is this whole you know force of saying that alternative lending is going to help bring people into the formal lending sector uh, because alternative lending even though it's not as heavily regulated as lending by banks it it still is some form of regulation right so the the overall logic is that you're um, building more expansive markets with weaker consu consumer protection norms and that enables individuals to move from informal credit absolutely informal credit such as from like your local money lender or from borrowing from your family and friends to formal credit markets that have stronger provisions for consumer protection so so here's you know this is something that i had been thinking about like how would this play out in practice so um let's move to this slide okay so so this, this is what is happening so far right like an individual goes to a bank the bank doesn't find a record on cc uh, on the credit information company or they find there's a record where the person has defaulted on like certain loans so this person has basically a thin file um so now the theory is that you know the individual goes to a fintech lender who profiles them based on their digital trade possibly profiles them better so gives them you know um a smaller loan amount that they can actually repay and does more regular monitoring so for all all, all of these reasons this person uh gets this loan then repays the loan and that that information then goes to the credit information company right and then ultimately the next time as slowly and slowly the person is able to build their credit record and so the next time the person goes to a bank there uh, they actually have a credit record so the bank is also willing to provide them a loan this to me is the financial inclusion story as it should play out but obviously like the the very confusing bit in all of this is that why would alternative lenders exist in this in this market because one that they are actually laying the framework for you know certain banks to to come in and um, take over some of their customers so what does this mean for alternative lenders right either that means that they charge rate of interest that justify the cost of lending um to risk your consumers that might or might not even be sort of long term consumers and the second thing is that they just don't report the good consumers which is of course a violation of the norms but uh, because there's weaker enforcement they can they can get away with it so ultimately as i said alternative lending will still perpetuate a tiered credit market where some have access to credit via less regulated uh, sort of norms and others are uh, get access through like more better regulated with like greater consumer safeguards okay um well yeah i'm i'm actually going to stop at that did i actually yep i i, I took a five minute break and, and i'm at 4:40 so i'm going to pause at that and take questions if there are any <coughs> or uh, we could have pranit and bini go through their comments first yes. while we get questions so sounds good we go on to first and just a quick one line introduction of you before you proceed with your comments so okay uh hi everyone uh, i'm pranit uh so i've been dabbling in fintech for a while for the last 3 years trying to build a lot of things but nothing actually played out uh yeah so that's a quick introduction i guess uh regarding questions uh i had a couple of uh sort of observations or questions i guess uh one is uh 
are there instances of the same person being targeted by different apps in the sense that uh, the reach uh, of most of these apps on Play Store uh, is it targeting the same set of people instead of actually uh, sort of uh, reaching out to different different segments? Uh, did you observe any of these things? Uh, maybe because the Play Store comments have similar names or uh, across the board. Okay. Uh, so one, I did not, I did not do any name analysis, but one thing that was very clear is that um, comments in people would often say things like, oh, I applied to XYZ person, like XYZ app, and they gave me a loan, but you took so long, right? Okay. Which is to say that, yes, they, they are trying their hand at multiple, multiple apps. Um, the other explanation of those sort of comments is to say that they're competitors, right? Yeah. Uh, like yeah. Listing those comments. I mean, yeah. I think one thing with Play Store comments is that, yeah, like you have to, for me, it was more like I, I was reading the comments and trying to understand how authentic they seemed. Uh, mm. But uh, we also know this from the, you know, the recent coverage that Z News had done and the reporting that followed that, yeah, a lot of people were accessing like five or six of these apps. So they were trying mm. their hand at a lot of them. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, another observation is that the, the pin code based discrimination actually happens here as well, uh, right. uh, obviously, uh, for both credit cards and house loans. Mm -hmm. uh, I've known instances where house loans are denied because a car can't get into that lane or uh, things like that. Uh, so that's, that's something which happens based on pin code uh, fairly com often here. Uh, that's one. And the last one is that uh, you spoke about alternative lenders uh, not reporting back to the credit bureaus. Uh, uh, even the regular banks, uh, what they do is if you have multiple cards with uh, different banks, they don't report back your new limit. They report back the limit you started out with. Uh, uh, Sorry, I lost you for a second. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't uh, update the newer limits. You have, say you keep paying up and your limits rise. They don't report back that. So I keep looking at my credit score once in a while and it actually does not reflect the limits which are assigned and uh, what is there. So that's uh, another thing uh, which I just noticed. Yeah. Uh, great. I, I could respond to that. So just by, very quickly, um, so there, there was a second paper that Srikant had uploaded as well, which was looking specifically only at discrimination, right? And why mm -hmm. discrimination in India and US uh, can be considered in some ways like or, or uh, different. And so I have zero doubts that there is profiling happening by surnames, by gender, by marital status. I'm sure all of that is happening in India already. Um, and there are no incentives for alternative lenders to fix it. Having said that, I do think that discrimination in lending means that you're leaving money on the table, right? So <laughs> discrimination means that there's someone who could possibly repay that loan right and pay that interest and you have decided to not give them the money mm -hmm. and that there is someone who perhaps is not worthy but because they have a certain you know come from a certain background they are deemed er erroneously deemed as uh, credit worthy right so in some ways there is a very like there is a market argument that you can say that your yeah, market should take care of discrimination but clearly it doesn't and it didn't in the case of the us because there's very what is called like taste-based discrimination right like you're discriminating because you just sort of very strongly disfavor a certain demographic. Mm -hmm. And in the US case, it made sense to, because so much the banking institutes, institutions were already under federal administration. Um, so the, the uh, majority white population was accessing loans primarily through those institutions. It came on the state to legislate against it, okay. right? Whereas in India where the majority of the banking, like lending, channels, so with, if it's informal lenders, are already not under, and all those informal channels, I'm sure, are also, also in a lot of ways, you know, discriminatory, but they're mm -hmm. not under the ambit of the, regu uh, the federal or the state administration, so you can't really legislate it. So yeah, like I think in some ways, it is, it is um, almost like ineffective to talk about discrimination i think it's something that we all have to be like very very like mindful of but i think if mm -hmm. it really came down to legis uh, like legislating it it would be very hard to enforce as as hard as all these other things are to enforce yeah. this would be especially hard to enforce i mean my hunch is that uh, because there is this uh, most of the apps uh, on play store at least fintechs are vc funded companies or 
primarily VC funded companies. And, uh, and my theory is that the metrics matter a lot uh, in terms of how many signups. Uh, they'll be biased towards having a ramp up uh, yeah. uh, to get the data that is as smooth as possible. But when it comes to dispersal, uh, they can still put a hold on it. So the number of signups does matter. Uh, and there are, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Which, which, then which also goes to say why they probably never say, like, you know, they, they'll continue to try and sell themselves as like easy loan. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. Yeah, Upfront yeah. friction is reduced as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's all the questions uh, I had. Yeah, Benny, you want to go next with your comments? Um, I think first I'd like to congratulate Tarunima uh, for being brave enough to kind of dip her feet into this topic and of course the co-authors. Um, I, I like her uh, assurance that, you know, credit was an easy problem to formulate because trust me, with some of us working in financial inclusion, it doesn't look like um, easy. Uh, I did, I mean, uh, the paper is great in terms of, uh, it does provide evidence for concerns we always had, but never um, had enough evidence to, you know, corroborate, for instance, harassment and debt recovery using of social networks. And to that extent, the idea of consumer outcomes and consumers' feedback on the Play Store is definitely novel, and it does kind of, you know, uh, provide us some kind of a starting point in terms of saying that these practices are happening, and therefore, you know, just to sound caution. I do feel I had a few comments slash uh, questions. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with comments. I think what you've done, Tarunima, is very interesting. And of course, I don't have the benefit of uh, looking at the 1.5 lakh comments you started with. But uh, what I was wondering was, did you have the opportunity to even see, like, provider-wise, you know, amongst the 11 providers, where are instances of default recurring more? Like, you know, if there were uh, in complaints of harassment or you know, clear indicators that there were defaulters uh, in via comments, you could clearly indicate, uh, understand if people were defaulting. And like, if there were one or two or I don't know, providers where people were defaulting more, uh, why that would be interesting is because it kind of also shows a, a little bit the modeling of the provider itself. So that's the second comment that I have that in your paper, actually, you list out almost to my mind, three kinds of costs of digital lending, right? The first one is almost the financial kind of costs where uh, people's phones can be uh, used as collaterals, they can be compounded, or the credit score uh, of the bureau can get affected. And then there are, of course, the social costs of losing social network because uh, providers reach out to social networks to harass you. And then the third is, of course, the privacy cost. But to my mind, a very important component of the credit bureau cost is also that what if the provider's model itself is faulty and is leading for people to default, right? And that could be unfortunately both intentional and unintentional, right? For instance, in Kenya, we've seen uh, around 2.7 million Kenyans uh, fault on ticket sizes of as small as $2. And the implication of that has been that they have been blacklisted from credit bureaus and they don't get any other loan. And actually they have to incur 20 times the cost to just get their names uh, removed from the blacklist of the credit bureau, right? So instead of uh, alternative lenders being that smooth escalation to formal lending, actually faulty models could distance people from formal lending even more, right? So not, uh, and that's just coming from bad models, which could uh, be because the data quality is bad in one case, or it could also be because just like Praneet said that VC money allows you to take that kind of risk, right? So, I mean, uh, you could, your recovery rates could be as low as 80%, which I can tell you in microfinance and VFC is a nightmare. We are used to like recovery rates of 95, 96 right? But recovery rates of 80% compounded with very high interest rates would still make business sense for a VC while having severe implications uh, in terms of financial inclusion and well-being of the consumer. And therefore, kind of looking at it, uh, looking at the comments from that end, if you find, you know, clustering of uh, default comments in one uh, 
provider or in specific providers, then does that highlight any kind of predatory activity? That would be very interesting for me. Um, I think the second uh, theme, uh, which, which of course attracts a lot of debate and yeah, uh, <laughs> none of us are, are unarmed, I guess. Uh, so uh, is the whole uh, tension around explainability versus, you know, uh, inclusion, I would almost say like that if you ask the provider to uh, create algorithms that are explainable, then they're likely to lose out on innovative data points and that can then affect their ability to include and therefore, you know, these are onerous conditions to impose. Now, uh, different providers definitely have different views. Uh, in our group, the providers uh, who kind of are also our advisors say that actually most of the providers do explain their algorithms anyway to the NBFC or to the partner bank because no bank or no NBFC would put their money without being assured that actually the model is robust. And they say that, you know, uh, they wouldn't mind uh, sharing such information, at least with the regulator, but the problem is they don't have confidence in the regulator's capacity, right? So they don't know if their IPR would be preserved or if the regulator will be able to understand the algorithm and you know how far can they trust the regulator in sharing such sensitive uh, IPR, basically. So uh, they, I mean, there are uh, ways, there is a level of intelligibility that has been worked out between, uh, let's say, algorithmic credit scorers and NBFCs and banks which is already allowing some level of explainability among them. I think what is uh, promoting that level of confidence is strong contractual obligations and you know, the NBFC's ability to uphold their models and protect the algorithm model. Uh, but that kind of um, is a barrier when it comes to the same level of information between the regulator and the provider. And maybe that's one way to kind of resolve that tension between explainability and accuracy. And uh, the third kind of comment that I have is, um, and I don't know, maybe this was a feature, a little bit of feature of your sample as opposed to you know other places that we have been to. But ever since 2017, we do understand uh, this was a qualitative study that we undertook uh, in 2017. It's a bit. Uh, I mean, we've spoken a lot about it and we're now following it up with a bigger study on privacy. But I think the comments from that study showed that even remote rural Indians actually did not think that exchange of personal data was trivial. And on some uh, kinds of personal data, they were pretty clear that they would actually not exchange it for any level of monetary benefit whatsoever. And one example that comes to mind is YouTube search history where people were like, I will not share that data even if you uh, make all my data consumption free. So I do think that there is an inherent line that the providers need to kind of draw uh, when they are asking for permissions for uh, you know, accessing data. I do see that some of the comments only when people were refused the loan the third time they accused providers of excessive data collection. But we kind of need to have a more empathetic view there. I think the view there is that loan products are pull products. And for this segment, they are probably even uh, more scarce because these are the segments that are definitely not being served by you know, formal financial institutions. So at that time of need, you are willing to make that sacrifice and you've taken the call to you know trade your data in some way, no matter how unwilling you were to do it, but you didn't have a choice. And then if you don't get a loan, that, you know, uh, that backlash should be seen in that context. And I think that also kind of uh, uh, makes it incumbent upon the provider to say that, you know, if your, if your, let's say, loan is rejected, we will delete this data in X number of days. We shall not use it further and those kinds of things, right? I mean, it's just a fair bargain. Uh, and I think that instead of kind of, saying that people uh, took it lightly first and then you know later they retaliated when they did not get a loan. I think there's a little bit of a, a scarcity of credit background there that kind of makes people fall in for it. And the last comment and with which I'll probably uh, kind of 
wrap up is i don't know if in your sample uh, you saw people who actually commended the app for ease of access also defaulting more i'll be very happy if uh, Uh, you know i'll be delighted if you could if there was a way that we could actually correlate those instances uh, where i'm coming from is that there is a lot of behavioral economic research now that shows that actually people don't take digital loans as seriously as they would take a mainstream loan right and some of it is just casual or sometimes they don't even realize they're signing up for a loan until you know the money has come and in kenya the research actually shows that sometimes people just mistake that money for uh, cash back rewards and don't even register that actually it's a loan and then it becomes due and then they don't understand what happened to them so the other question like i i see that ease of access is great and you know ease of getting credit is great short talk turn around times are great but is there a second level analysis that we need there that just about how easy should it be is it too easy for the consumer to get the loan that they don't even realize they've gotten one and now they are in that cycle of credit uh, that was i think my last comment and i think this is a great uh, endeavor you you've heard it from me before as well so there's no excuse there what i would be very interested in is that if ever you want to go back to this data set or you know like open it up for others then probably uh, we uh, there's scope to do like more analysis on what are the kind of um, terms and conditions that got disapprovals across the board right that provider uh, that users across providers did not approve of and maybe that itself uh, gives you the starting baseline for regulation that this this set of you know tactics or this set of terms are actually definitely not conforming to users reasonable expectations nobody is liking them and therefore as a starting point bare minimum providers must not indulge in collateralizing mobile phones or using nude pictures as we saw but unfortunately in china so i think that kind of an analysis would be a good one Great. Um, so okay, thank you so much, Benny. Also for like very very thoughtful comments. Um, and so I have like these four buckets, and I'll take the time to address each of them separately. So I think the first one was where we were talking about, um, you know, you you mentioned this very interesting point of faulty models. So I, uh, all the concerns about or all the suggestions about the the, the further analysis, uh, I'll come to it right at the end. But so the first thing was, you know, what happens when you have forty individuals that could distance, um, so forty models that could distance more individuals, because it makes sense for the uh, tech company to do it. It doesn't make sense for the individual, right? So it doesn't make sense for the borrower. And so I think this is something that Dwara has uh, sort of really uh, spearheaded, right? This idea of like suitability of finance. and thinking about it from the perspective of the borrower rather than from the perspective of the lender i think that's a point well taken that's a point really well taken i think specifically in the case of um, kenya and i'm sure you you eventually saw the government just like write off like eventually clear out the debts for a lot of people because there were so many people who were defaulting and so in some ways and this is something i i definitely skipped a lot while i was presenting as well but uh, you know i i think of this um, this whole credit problem there are like four lenses to look at it so there's the there's the fiscal stability lens there's the surveillance lens there's the accountability lens and then there's a the fairness lens right so there are like these four perspectives and like that fiscal stability lens is something i did not touch upon at all and um, and that fiscal stability lens is very very important for the regulator as well not just for the individual it's important for the regulator because you're sort of like undermining um like your lending institutions and your the stability of your lending market all together so um yeah i think it's it's um yeah like i i i don't have like a great response to it i do know that there are no incentives in, in terms of the providers to fix this problem so i think this is perhaps a place where um you either need like regulators but i also one of the things that i've often thought is that there need there needs to be a guiding line to say that these are the forms of loans in which we are willing to experiment and these are the forms in which we're not willing to experiment right so so maybe we're willing to have you know we're willing to provide these these sort of use these very risky models for cons- consumption smoothing right like it it isn't the worst thing that someone is um, it's not that uh sort of critical if someone is using some of these platforms to buy movie tickets you know 
fine. I don't think I don't think I care about that use case as much as let's say someone who is uh, who doesn't have access to any resources and then gets uh, sort of screwed by one of these platforms. Sorry for that. Uh, should, <laughs> should use a better word. So okay. So I don't have a great response to that. Um, the second issue that you mentioned was explainability versus accuracy, right? So I think my explainability there are two forms. So you can have explainability towards the regulator, which is I think what you were suggesting. So where the models are explained to either the NBFC or the bank, because of course they're contractual obligations, or they're explained to the regulator because the regulator cares about how these institutions are working. But that the other mechanism, the other direction of accountability is for towards the individual, right? So in the U, in the American context, explainability is mandated as a law because it gives me as an individual a way to say whether this person is discriminating against me uh, based on my race or not, right? Um, I mean that's a very simplistic example. And so um, if you think about it from, from the perspective of an individual, it is not even important for me to know the algorithm, right? So um, in the in the American context, none of the banks are really discussing their algorithms with their consumers. I then also not discussing their algorithms with their um, their uh, the regulators, right? Because again, as you mentioned, IP issues. And so then explainability comes down to the specific like parameter. It it comes down to the parameter based of which um, you know you have been denied a loan. And that's kind of where the whole issue of in, uh, sort of non-intuitiveness and scrutability becomes important because sure like i think uh nbfc might even still be convinced by like just listening to your algorithm and you know saying that okay like you're using these five data points and you know you're doing xyz and this is like you know what explanation means to a regulator or a nbfc might not actually be useful for a consumer so the, um yeah so i think those are the second that's the second aspect uh, the third one was you mentioned the personal data i think again this is uh, perhaps um, me not having provided um, additional details, but yeah, like I definitely, it, at least in the longer paper, there are comments where there are people who have just outright denied or like have not applied for a app because they have realized that this app is stealing data, right? And so um, e even on the slides, there were two comments. And the first comment is where the person is just outright denied and they are like, they say that, okay, you know, uh, you're stealing my data. But then the other thing is that I think the other comment is interesting to also say that you know, consent or um, what feels fair in one moment, right? Like it, it's it's actually to your point that when people think something, they're, they're in the need for, you know, it's, it's like when you say that poverty is a form of coercion, it's that you feel that I really need it. And so therefore you're willing to part with your data. But when that service is pulled back, suddenly that entire transaction feels unfair. Um, and largely to, I mean, the other thing that you were mentioning about, you know, people will not part with personal data. I think there are very strong endowment effects with privacy, right? And that's something that's been, that's been studied. And I think I would be interested in seeing what those endowment effects look um, specifically in case of, you know, loans. So is it that, you know, once again, I think the comment to a lar large extent is alluding to that effect. It's like, yeah, like if I have access to it, I'm willing to part with it. But you know, if I, if you ask me in vacuum and say that, Oh, will you, you will you give me all your data for you know, the last five, months of where all you've traveled and I will give you hundred rupees in return, you probably will, you know, not, not agree to it. So, so yeah, I think endowment effects are going to be fairly uh, important in all digital platforms, but also with, uh, with lending platforms as well. Um, and then the last one, you know, in terms of uh, ease of access. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think the materiality of any, yeah, like uh, <laughs> it really affects the perception, right? So, so paper is a frictionful process and, and in some ways, that friction is perhaps something that is that slows people down, and there, we can argue that there is like some merit to it, right? Like at least, um, and similarly, I think that there are certain apps that try and make the process more frictionful than others, and so in some ways, I think some apps do a better job of uh, sort of uh, informing people about the formality of the process than others. So certain apps really are, you know, using very colorful characters are using cartoons they really want and this is what Pranit was saying that they actually want to get users but I, I do think that there's certain other apps that are actually creating friction as well and so um, yeah I agree that like that ease of access is not uh, something that should just be universally celebrated uh, I think um, in some ways we want the friction to go down but in other ways we also don't um, and so finally in terms of the second level analysis uh, I think frequency any frequency based analysis with Play Store comments is somewhat risky uh, because you don't have a unique ID, right? So people's names keep changing. Having said that, yeah, I think, um, I absolutely, I think there's always like room and I'm happy to share the data with anyone. It's a, it's a pain to collect this data. So please, please take this data and <laughs> what you want to do with it. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to pause at that. Also, to, uh, to add to the ease of access, uh, uh, there is a foundation called Money and Mental Health uh, in uh, in UK, uh, which uh, sort of studies how uh, giving loan to vulnerable groups uh, and uh, the recollection, how, how it impacts the mental health, basically. Uh, and so, sort of sometimes I might have signed up for a loan app when um, maybe I'm I'm happy and normal, uh, but there are times when, say, I'm in a downward cycle and I just want to go on a spending spree, and this app is available right there, and there's no friction, right? Uh, so I can just go ahead and use it. Uh, some uh, providers have gone ahead and allow uh, people to place gambling blocks in, in the UK, that is. Uh, they allow you to place a gambling block where you have to talk to a, a person to unblock it. So you can place the block yourself when you are when you know that you want to change your behavior, uh, but to unblock it, you need to actually talk to somebody. So there's a friction introduced. Uh, so things like that, uh, for example, uh, I think that at least with credit cards and credit scores, uh, there needs to be a way where I can say that, I know I'm I'm given a one lakh credit or whatever, but I just don't want more than 5,000 this month. Or uh, ability to say that I don't want the maximum credit limit given to me. I just want thousand rupees or reduce your credit limit rather so there, there are some people who are trying to go in that direction but i'm i'm not sure if uh, if anybody is actually doing that here uh, yet uh, friction while you want to pay for a service uh, like friction while you try to shop more than uh, x amount uh, that might be a good thing so. I think that's already there in credit cards in India where you can set sublimits and so on. But that, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's still, I mean, it's somewhere in there, uh, okay. inside the app somewhere. So, right. So, Anand had a couple of questions. So I'm going to unmute him. Uh, Anand, can you speak up? Yeah, Anand? Yeah, can you hear? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I had a whole bunch of questions. Uh, the first is uh, when you say it collected all these apps, uh, all this data, uh, it is based on uh, what you saw on the Play Store with respect to analyzing permissions or it is based on what you analyzed it on the wire? We analyzed it on the wire. Yeah, we normally put a snooping uh, proxy on the wire and see what the app sends back in order to be 100% sure that these are the claims that are made. No, no, no. This was literally like just XPath based, yeah, front end scraping. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Did any of the apps ever show any information to uh, the people who are using it that this is all the data that we are collecting? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like explicit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if actually you see the two screenshots, so you can actually try this with Crazy B, right? it goes into like a lot of detail about exactly all the things. So it's like mentioning SSID, it's mentioning IMEI, it's mentioning all the like little, little parameters it's collecting on the splash screen, which again, I don't think, especially if it's in English, like a lot of people are not going to be able to read it, but um, a lot of apps are clarifying that. So, okay. uh, just to uh, add on to that, uh, probably what needs to be seen is whether they're disclosing everything, uh, because in, in some cases, even if you disclose at a permission level, you still won't know what the code exactly is doing and they may still taking away something more than what they actually say it in their message. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's probably another thing in itself, uh, what they're disclosing and what they're actually collecting. Also, they change across versions, so they could have tried out an experiment at some point. So. True. All valid points. Yes. Yeah. The other the other thing that always interests me is the is the user comment which said, "Hey, I didn't take the loan, but someone used my yeah. phone and took the loan." Okay. Uh, was it like uh, was it like a common comment that you saw? I definitely that... saw. No, no. I definitely saw. Like I can uh, I can think like of three clear comments I saw of these. I don't remember yeah the exact numbers, but yeah, there were definitely some of these comments. Uh, especially when it came to like reduction of civil scores and people were like, no, 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 but it wasn't me. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, w was there any kind of model that uh, was kind of visible about how these people predict uh, uh, failures and so on? Or was it just all make-believe stuff? Uh, if, could you clarify what you mean by what, what I mean is like, look, uh, so usually uh, if you look at information theory in general, right? Uh, you collect, say, two data points, uh, you attach some kind of weightage on the data point by saying, if this data point falls within the range, this is the amount of uh, uh, 
predict, and this is the percentage of people who would probably for, pay, not repay. So every data point that you typically collect uh, has an informational value on the prediction, whatever the prediction is. They will pay, they will not pay, yeah. maybe age is the predictor. I mean, there is some informational value. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually what we normally see uh, in fraud analytics is that uh, you need about, uh, it's, it's a long tail uh, thing in the sense that yeah. Uh, if you collect 40 uh, data points or what we call as 40 features, uh, it's kind of very hard for you to say why are you collecting that particular data point uh, without correlating with prediction value. I mean, what is the what is the information value that is adding to the whole uh, thing? Uh, so that is the part that I was surprised because if they're collecting so much, right, there has to be some thought process behind uh, it. And if you're coming, all you're coming back and saying, I'm collecting contactless because uh, we, if you fail to give a loan, I can call and threaten your mom. Uh, is, is, is that how it is? Or is it like you, you are able to see a lot of uh, people doing copy exactly because there is one app, A, which collected so much of data point, I'm just going to copy and collect it. Or did you see any kind of spectrum patterns around it by saying this app only collected so much, but that app mm -hmm. collected and the most uh, popular ones versus not so popular ones and so on. Right. Um, so... Uh, Anand, let me know if I'm understanding you correctly. So you're saying that basically there's a, the prediction value comes from a, from the correlation of a lot of data points, right? And so it's when when these data points sort of um, support each other and contribute uh, without us knowing how much each contributes, it's hard to say that therefore I will only collect like X data points and not like X plus 10 data points, right? And so the um, in some ways the impulse is to collect X plus 10, right? Yeah. And uh, and so your question is that is, is there a consistent pattern for why people are right. collecting all these data points? Is that yeah. it? Understanding yeah. correctly? Right. Okay. So so one thing is that um, you know I actually think that there is no um, yeah like I don't think there is any sort of very well thought out reason for why people are collecting. I, I mean uh, so, okay. I the reason I'm saying this is because there are no incentives to be conservative about the data you're collecting. Right. So I work with the assumption that they are collecting all the data they can. And this is something you're seeing with the permissions graph as well, that you know, every app collects location data, every app, of course, storage and network information makes sense. There's only like this one app that does not collect content, con contact information. And so um, I, to the extent that that is indicative of the importance of some of these data points, we can say something about it, but uh, let's say IMEI number, right? Um, and SSID numbers, like I don't know why, like to what extent that does that help? And if, um, you know, if there's any lender who's like willing to, I think this is like something for me, which a, which a uh, regulatory sandbox is really well equipped to do, right? It's like to understand what is the predictive power of all these additional data points, because I think that then really helps you weigh out some of these privacy slash um, accuracy concerns. I think we've, we've law, okay, maybe, maybe I'm speaking prematurely, but when I read the, pre, the data protection bill, my sense is that we have, we no longer have the ability to say that uh, just don't collect personal data and don't profile me based on that. I think we've already like lost that ground. So then for me, like the next more reasonable approach is to say, okay, then let's at least put limits and say what of these, these data points are actually necessary and which of these are not. So um, yeah, I don't know to what extent each of these contribute to the prediction and I can't tell that from the data. Okay, because I had a very interesting incident uh, yeah. with uh, Simple, right? Uh, we used to do a lot of office purchase uh, for the office canteen. Right, and it's usually a small OTP uh, phone that used to be there in office. So one day, my office manager basically said uh, we, we had a bunch of guests, and uh, it so happened that our phone also blew up the previous day. Uh, so we bought a cheaper phone because we couldn't get, uh, we didn't want to spend uh, that seven thousand rupee or eight thousand rupee phone uh, for getting OTP on or the simple thing. Uh, so he basically went and ordered 20 samosas and the transaction was declined uh, because he came back and said, uh, well, we are collecting your IMEI and your phone model and the goddamn phone is only 3,000 or 4,000 rupees in our opinion and your guy is spending 20,000 rupees for samosas. I mean, what the hell is this? Uh, okay, I mean, uh, these, so this basically comes and tells you that the prediction value uh, uh, of every data point, which is uh, the phone model and, and, and so on, and, uh, so that's what I was trying to really understand. I mean, is there is there a spectrum in which you see? Uh, because most of it is extraneous. And one thing that we have learned in statistical science is uh, if you collect a lot of random value uh, by just sheer randomness of the domain, uh, everything would look like uh, there is a correlation, but the correlation doesn't mean a thing. It's just pure random correlation. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, again, but I think there are like some really, uh, I think the challenge here is the lack of data on these models, right? Because like once you have that, there are like really, the, you have methods out there that will let you pull out the more significant um, variables, right? So like the IMEI number that you were mentioning, I think you can tell from the data and say that in like 3% of the cases, it's actually provided the critical uh, decision. And right. therefore, like that's a cost I'm willing like I'm willing to let not collect that data because that three percent doesn't matter to me, right? right. So I think I, those methods will definitely exist. Okay. But the the challenge is we don't have them. Like we don't have these this data and these models in the open. I think that for me is the bigger challenge. Okay, I will ask a very provocative question. Mm. Uh, so do these models even exist, or it's all make believe? <laughs> do these models even even exist? Yeah, or it is all make believe? Okay. I mean, you, you think about it from, uh, so here is the uh, harder problem that I usually had on finance uh, and uh, thing, right? Uh, you are basically saying that people would pay or not pay, I mean, recovery rate and all that kind of stuff uh, based on prediction. And uh, it's very unclear to me that all these variables, I mean, there is, there is no physical uh, limits to any of these variables, okay? So it's all make-believe. I mean, in the sense that, uh, until yesterday, uh, things were working. Until today, it stopped working because something in the real world changed. So, my that is a fundamental question in the sense that these models do even exist, or it's just make believe. I mean, I find it very hard uh, to say that uh, uh, that a model exists which is not discussed widely, uh, because if you discuss it widely, people would game the model. I mean, that's the question that I was asking. I mean, regarding gaming the model, uh, at least uh, uh, what I would say is, if you go to YouTube and search for loan in five minutes, you will find videos which have at least half a million hits, which all show how to go through the steps to get an instant personal loan in India. Uh, so gaming happens. Uh, that's, that's given, I guess, irrespective of what the algorithm is. Okay. Uh, that's it. I, I had nothing else. Yeah, but Anand, I'm, I'm still like trying to, un I don't think I fully understood your question, which is that, is this make believe? And, and my instinct is to say no, because actually, I think that when you said sort of mentioned this, I didn't respond to it, you know, when, when I said that it's been modeled as a prediction problem, um, at least like uh, that's coming from the fact that this, the whole entity called FICO starts because these two statisticians decide to, you know, uh, sort of compute this statistic statistical number based on all the data, right? Like they basically go about asking all these banks for data and then they say they're going to compute this number. And so at least to that and that this is happening in the 60s. So they were ready before you even have any sophisticated uh, algorithms. They're just like, yeah, yeah it may, you can crunch these numbers in a way that it is indicative in some ways of whether someone will pay a loan or not. So that's kind of what I meant. And, and so to that extent, Anand, it is like that exists and that is not made believe, right? Like the, it is that it's it's very sort of temporal and it's, it's, it's something that needs to be like very consistently adjusted. But, uh, and, and I'm sure, uh, I, since I spoke to certain data scientists who I thought were fairly uh, qualified, I'm going to assume they were actually doing serious work. And so okay, see, uh, my skepticism comes from talking to data scientists uh, who basically <laughs> lost to one, uh, $10 billion in 15 seconds on quant trading because they came and told me that uh, those models really work in the real world. I mean, that's basically what I was trying to tell. So, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think there are more questions as well. We can come back. It's, uh, so, Harshanga Patil from YouTube asks, uh, how do you define something as financial data and what is not in unsecured cases? Um, sorry, what is not? What is not? Unsecured cases. What is not financial data? How do you define something as financial data and what is not in unsecured uh, cases? What is not financial data? I mean, so financial data is basically your uh, spending pattern, your anything that you've done with your credit card, anything that like your bank would typically know about you, right? So that is what financial data is. I um, I know that in some cases, um, also again, even in the US context, context, it's fairly tricky because even though banks are not allowed to use or lenders are not allowed to use use financial data, there are like these intermediaries that will then use non-financial data to like scope customers. So it's, it's very, very like fishy. Again, it's one thing like what, what the law says and it's one thing that ha what happens on the ground, right? So, so yeah, like um, there are ways of using non-financial data for um, even like at least scoping out people for loan decisions. Uh, but ultimately the bank cannot be using um, like some of that data, right? So 
that's a bit of a tangent to your question but in general it would be spending data it would be yeah like your fixed deposits your um savings things like those that would be financial data it's kind of it's it's also easier to define what is not financial data right like my contact is not my, is not financial data that's fairly clear um what is not uh, what is not in unsecured cases i'm i'm having a bit of like i'm, I'm just having like a bit of a blank moment what is not financial data what is not financial data in unsecured cases so in unsecured cases like let's say your credit card is an unsecured case right and um in an unsecured case like my credit card doesn't really collect any information other than my spending and my bank i mean in in the spirit of the law like in the letter of the law they're not supposed to like whether they go and collect my social media data is a separate thing but they're not supposed to so in that's an unsecured case where you are only using financial data um Am I? And can someone clarify that second part to me? I don't know why I'm finding that a little. Yeah, confusing. I think even the question reads probably. Uh, I think like uh, on the chat, you can uh, elaborate on the second part. Uh, there's one more question from Chirag uh, who asks, uh, "What are the parameters used to judge how much to lend? So how much, uh, and what are these parameters that are getting yeah. how much?" right so also someone else on the panel can also go with this i can can attack my first uh, yeah first answer so so there is there are two as uh, there's two aspects which come into play at the beginning of the loan decision right so there is loan pricing and then there is like this so the, the first thing is should i lend or not if i should lend what to what interest should i charge given the risk i'm taking in lending to a specific person so both of those you use modeling and data to make both those decisions and uh, those parameters are just as opaque so we can assume that your location contact all those things that are being used to judge whether to give you a loan or not are also being judged to um assess how risky you are and therefore how much uh, you should how much interest you should pay right i will just add on that uh, based on the look of these apps so there are apps for variety of demographics the student apps for instance say lend you only till 5 Ten, fifteen thousand. Whereas there are other apps which go till like fifty thousand. The, the largest I've seen in the app space is like five lakhs. Uh, and I don't know if it's if this is due to a limitation of say payment systems or uh, any other credit related regulations. But uh, beyond that, it's not say digitally digitally available. Uh, that's on like. Uh, but again, individually, it will vary on pricing and uh, the credit person. Uh, but this is a broad. and also the average household savings is about 2 to 3000 rupees i think uh, in india so any emi uh, sort of reverse fits into that uh, to be around 3000 to 4000 uh, anything more than that becomes harder for somebody to sort yeah, of uh, make room for there are ranges say somewhere around like 3 uh, months i think that's because google came hard on the payday loans uh, the largest tenor that i saw these apps was like Very four months. Uh, and uh, another comment question. Uh, super interesting insights. Very thin between and between abusing privacy and using it accurately. What regulations exist to protect consumers' rights? Uh, it's a very broad, open-ended question. Anyone wants to take that? Yeah, I could crack at it. Um, so. particularly in the case of digital lending like tarunima's paper uh, points out sufficiently it's kind of a gray area in terms of regulation what regulation uh, it attracts and in fact the fact that people are using comments as grievance redress uh, itself goes on to show the kind of regulatory architecture or the lack of it around it i think one development that might be of interest to everybody is on 24th of june this year um, the rbi basically said that if a digital lender is actually partnering with a bank or an nbfc then they have to clearly mention the bank or the nbfc they are partnering with and then the grievance redress mechanisms available to the bank or the nbfc also become available to the people who actually access loans why are these digital lenders so i think this is kind of uh, the needle has kind of moved from not even acknowledging these intermediaries as intermediaries to kind of saying that yes they exist and in fact the opacity in their relationship with the bank is actually leading to a lot of gaps in consumer protection 
And therefore, what the RBI has now, it's a very short five point document. But one of the points in the documents is that actually all the grievance redress mechanisms available to banks or NPFCs will now be available to people who uh, avail of those loans, but via these digital intermediaries. What that also means is that now the loan contract that you get is no longer, you know, a click on your mobile phone or smartphone interface, but actually you'll get a loan contract on the letterhead of that bank or the NBC. And therefore, I think there's a greater uh, clarity in terms of accountability to the consumer and uh, what they're also using. And it's a trend that it's, it's an evolving trend in the financial sector at large. I feel that regulators are now leaning on regulated entities to kind of, uh, you know, regulate the fintech or the intermediary or the service providers. They're seeing this in the payments aggregator space where aggregators are now supposed to uh, audit for merchants. We're now seeing it in the case of the RPI leading on NBFCs to regulate uh, digital lenders. We're seeing it in the case of IRDAI, which is leaning on, let's say, insurance providers to regulate how Make My Trip offers, you know, travel insurance. So uh, this is an interesting trend. And as more complications and papers like Tarunima's come out, I think uh, the uh, basically the grievance redress network will have to keep expanding. And uh, the ideal there, I think, is uh, it's a lot of... Uh, so I think the problem with India is that a lot of these laws were not there in the banking laws themselves. So for instance, credit uh, decisions are bound by, if I can use the word, or are informed by the fair practices codes, which are not binding on the provider. They say that you can't discriminate, but really there is no obligation on the provider in stark contrast to, let's say, the US, right? So because they don't exist in the baseline provider, it's hard for them to trickle down to digital providers where it's where the issue of discrimination is harder because even if you're not actively discriminating, you're picking up proxies that are causing discrimination and all kinds of issues come up. So I think that's the bigger problem that you have to basically create a place within the banking regulation and financial regulation for some of these issues and then hope that they expand to digital vendors. And uh, I'll just add a quick point on the explainability around the credit information companies. Uh, that's basically uh, the CIC Act uh, kind of gives the consumer two rights. So one is uh, a right to access the credit report uh, from any of the four bureaus, uh, one free report per year. And uh, in that report, if they actually find something like their score is low or they got downgraded or something, they actually have that uh, a recourse mechanism to kind of ask the CIC company uh, as to why, explain me why my score got tipped. And I think that's, that's one provision. I don't know how much of it is directly getting used, but uh, I've seen pretty much all the CICs have a uh, nice amount of consumer redressal uh, uh, path, uh, which you can do even online uh, and, and ask for an explanation as to why your score is low or something. And, and, and I think uh, for the people who get uh, scored based on these uh, apps due to some faulty data, I think they they need to actually go up and ask the CIC saying that somebody else downloaded the app and you kind of downgraded me and that's, that's one. Right. Um, if I could also just add on, so I think one thing for me through all of this was that there are already a lot of mechanisms that exist. And um, I think what Benny uh, said made a lot of sense, which is that you need to uh, code some of these, you need to code some of these considerations into the laws for banks and NBFCs rather than really, you know, uh, coming up with something new for digital lenders. I think it will eventually trickle down. And so the interesting thing, and this is completely my ignorance, is that I assumed through um, my research that alternative lenders were bound by all the laws that NBFCs were bound by, not realizing that, yeah, like if people did not have, did not know which NBFC or alternative lender was tied to, they would never be able to enforce, you know, or call for um, enforcement of some of these, these uh, uh, mandated laws. So um, I think also on explainability for me, one of, I also have been wondering, you know, why is it that we have these sort of um, different criteria? So this is something I do want to spend more time on, which is that you say that explainability is important for credit information companies. So you say that civil needs to explain decisions and you say banks need to explain decisions. And so that's in the fair practices code for banks, but then you're saying NBFCs don't. Right. And so there, there's perhaps like a historical reason because of, of, you know, the kind of institutions that were becoming NBFCs, but it's also important to cons consistently relook at why, you know, that 
uh, distinction was made in the first place and is that distinction still valid for the kind of uh, companies that are becoming nbfcs now right so yeah i do generally i think a lot of these mechanisms do exist it's a matter of like acting on them yeah and one other last question on youtube was uh, from harshanga again uh, as of now we have to evaluate that person uh, we have to evaluate that person as there exists nothing about that person is the solution to somehow add everyone into the credit market and then extract financial info and i think he clarifies uh, my question is more like as india is not a, on credit system as much as us is are there any innovative digital solutions which other countries came up which were lot more fair uh, yeah um i caught the last part i didn't catch the first part so the the second part is are there examples from other countries that are in some ways a lot more fair than yes. than the indian uh, system okay and then what was the first part of that question uh so how to bring everyone into the credit market and then extract financial info basically it is and yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um i mean so so again like the the last flow chart i i pointed out was you know yeah like if if that worked out in theory you'd have it you basically give a lot of loans to again you know a very very theoretical discussion but yeah if you basically gave out a uh, well priced loans to a lot of people you might have made those decisions based on really sort of um personal data but after that if you kind of reported those uh if you reported the consumer behavior to the credit bureau eventually that will lead up to a point where we actually have people's financial data right because credit bureau is only collecting information of whether you have you defaulted on a loan or not um i mean so that in theory that is supposed to work also uh, this alternative lending is not unique to india like it's it's in a lot of developing countries i think other countries have uh, some other countries have are further ahead on this use, on the use of alternative data so then he had mentioned uh, mshwari in kenya so that they're definitely ahead i know i think bulgaria uses it as well in fact i would say that a lot of countries are not as touchy about using non uh, personal data as the us is and that's also because of the the history that and i would say to an extent also europe because there is this history of racial profiling which which makes this use of personal data very touchy um a, a lot of countries actually use use uh, alternative data in creative ways i also again i do want to think say that yeah there are um, we should also be thinking you know beyond just lending apps in the sense that we shouldn't just give up on our existing institutions that exist like um it's we should we perhaps you can use technology in ways that banking contracts by banks become cheaper not necessarily that people have to trade their data using alternative uh, lending apps right so there are more ways of thinking about technology as well but i think benny and pranith you best should add there is one more question from somebody called legit money uh, how do we validate profession type by borrowers we have a digital lending platform users are inputting farmer plumber as profession but can we validate their profession uh, i am not sure if that kind of fitted you but just to ask around that question uh, in the comments have you kind of uh, done some kind of analysis on say demographics of the users you said you didn't do a name analysis but are there any other kind of demographic uh, analysis that you were able to do and see like what what are the kind of sentiments across different set of users right okay so i know i know this i never did this but i know that most of them were men um and that that is just because i can visually see the names and you know the photographs that come with those but i never consistently went and and again i i had to work on the assumption that this is low quality data right so when someone says even if like let's say it's a woman on these uh, on play store she might not really want to use her name because of a lot of uh, sort of safety considerations but from what was um, what was stated and where things were not listed as a google user most of the names were men but i don't have a number to say how many were men again i would be making assumptions right like this this name belongs to a male and this belongs to a female so it's or a non male person so yeah. 
that the data is highly restricted is what i would say i again i'm happy to hand it over to anyone who wants to use it but it's it's fairly limited yes so on the question of data i'll probably share something that we uh, did uh, just in time for this meeting so this is uh, a digital lending app database uh, tarunima in her study at at during her study in 2017 to 19 she analyzed 72 apps and then picked 11 out of them i think it's grown a lot more than that i've just picked the first page on the google play store for the search loan and i've got this 111 apps i'm sure there are probably some two or three hundred more with different spellings for credit and credit with a k and so on uh, but what this does give you is the entire play store's metadata around uh, we'll be putting this on the uh, website and you can just have a look at all the kind of apps uh, what are they uh, the contact details and the one interesting parameter that i saw is the developer address uh, most of the formal companies actually have a legit address whereas some of them don't have and they also have a developer ad address with a gmail uh, these are like red flags uh, probably because you're not dealing with an entity or probably dealing with a person and uh, there are also some which uh, put ads on their uh, lending app i don't know why some lending app would do ads on their app uh, uh, but there are again more to analyze with this data and uh, we'll be putting this data out so i'm happy to share with anyone who wants to do more uh, around this data as well and with that uh, we don't have any other questions okay there's one comment from legit money again uh, we have done univariate multivariate analysis based on demographic geographic customer credit data Uh, right now we are using a rule based system for charging interest we're getting credit data from civil and equifax these are comments on legit money so i I'd, i'd love to talk i i absolutely would uh, if you guys are doing rules based that's pretty fabulous i'd love to like uh, like understand what your accuracy etc all of that is so uh, yeah so legit money you can probably email pranima and uh, talk yeah. for the uh, there are no more questions comments uh, i would like to close uh, and i like to thank uh, tarunima for going through this uh, for talking through her paper and uh, thanks praneet and beni for joining us with your comments and thank you everyone for staying tuned on a saturday evening thank uh, you thank you shrikant for the opportunity and for the questions and i i i feel bad that my jokes on the post five slides were lost <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye.